Hello? Okay. We good? So um, expanding on this, even when something is free of charge, there, there can be long-term costs. That's the free puppies. Um, I have a free puppy that I got 13 years ago, spend lots of money on their food, take her to the vet last week. It was fairly expensive. We buy her equipment and all these other um, things. So what's the equivalent in the phosphorgy community? Even if you get the software free, you need some kind of machine <laughs> to, to run the software um, or a virtual machine in the cloud. You need your time to learn about it, get trained, install it. And sometimes that's not enough, and sometimes, frequently, people pay money to have help in setting up their open source initiative or their tooling or bringing it into a new company. And open source has proven itself to be big business. This was kind of the mother of all open source transactions. In 2019, IBM bought Red Hat for $34 billion. Um, there's clearly a lot of commerce going on in the ecosystem. And even if we look at something like a phosphorgy conference, there's a lot of investment being made. Every one of the um, people on the sponsor list here is paying money that they have to either promote themselves or show their support for open communities. And it's interesting, there are some very large companies that have invested, Google, um, Meta, Facebook, Planet, but there's also an interesting trend where some of the smaller companies are making bigger investments. Our, our platinum sponsor, Geocat, is a relatively small company, same with, same with um, Geosolutions. But there's generally a win-win for both. The conference gets support to promote open source. The business gets uh, exposure to let people know what's going on. And they show that they play by the rules. They're willing to invest back in these open communities. Another trend that I saw um, when there were before, just before COVID when there were um, uh, in-person conferences is I went to a con an ESRI, uh, a conference that had Jack Dangerman speaking, and lo and behold, out of nowhere comes this slide talking about how much they support open source. So, okay, that was a surprise. And then I was at another conference where uh, G General Electric, a very large company, was having a conference for all their partners. And again, in the keynote speech, embracing open source technologies. Why, why are these big companies going out of their way to say we do open source stuff? It's because people want it. Um, it's gotten out there. CIOs are aware of it. And being aligned with open source helps their business. And hopefully, they're doing it um, earnestly and, and fairly, and not just as a, a marketing spiel. So um, how, do, how do people actually make money? I'm going to just tell a couple of stories of how, how things play out in this ecosystem. Uh, the big one, you know, why was Red Hat worth $34 billion? They provide uh, services and support to the, to the Linux community. They help enterprises adopt and deploy, and when needed, they can add new features that may not have been in the software at that time, sort of contract programming. And there are a lot of other companies out there that do this. Uh, Crunchy Data does it uh, for, uh, for PostgreSQL. Um, they're companies that are very supportive of QGIS and help organizations adopt these particular kinds of technologies. And then there's another example. Uh, my friend Randy Hale, who runs a one-person company in southeastern uh, United States, Tennessee. And uh, one of his customers is Henry County with 32 residents. And he helped them move from an expensive Esri setup to a very efficient, modern, um, open stack. Basically doing what Red Hat does, but at a very small scale, more personal scale. And so he replaced his commercial Esri stack with Linux, QGIS, Postgres, GeoServer, and added one uh, 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 paid subscription to Fulcrum, uh, which has an open source component. And the Esri stack costs something on the order of $34,000. And, uh, and then on the, um, his new stack cost $360, but it was not free. They hired him, and for the $6,000, he helped them choose the right things, get the right machines, install it, 
and then he now has a long-term service contract, so if anything breaks or anything needs upgrading, he takes care of it. The other very common uh, model is basically leveraging and incorporating existing phosphor G technology into a product. So you build something, there's a lot of your own intellectual property, but you're building a foundation or using a tool that's available in the open community. And GeoCAD, our platinum sponsor, is a, a good example of that. I was checking out their website, and I was like, oh, this would be a perfect example for my, uh, my uh, talk. Um, they've launched a new service called GeoCAD Live, and it's powered by FOSS infrastructure. Uh, their customers just pay for a service, but they use FOSS tools under the hood to keep that service alive and running without their customers worrying about it. They also do enterprise editions of GeoServer and GeoNetwork, and this sort of goes back, it's a little bit more like Red Hat, where they basically have provided professional support to keep GeoServer, GeoNetwork working for other organizations. And then there's this one, which is, which is a little trickier um, uh, to describe. Um, it's called open sourcing your own commercial technology. Um, so you decide, we have something cool, we're going to make it open source. Sometimes you just do it for love and passion, it's fun, you created something cool. Other times you're hoping this thing will go viral and you'll make money. Um, and of course, if you do offer something at no cost, it can get adoption and create attention. And maybe it attracts new contributors. And then there's this thing called the freemium model. Um, which uh, article from the information and e zine um, that I subscribe to, and they pretty much wire it, so I'm just going to read it. Their approach usually is to develop features they include in a basic free product with the goal of attracting enough users that some would start to pay for advanced features. Fair enough. And then you have the MongoDB freemium and open source example. Uh, MongoDB uh, was introduced, um, I'm not exactly sure, somewhere in, in the teens. They're now a $24 billion company as of last Friday when I was doing my slides. And the question is how open is open? And there's a sort of interesting feud between Mongo, uh, Mongo and AWS, where AWS originally took Mongo's free thing and started building a service that they were charging uh, people to use on Amazon that was similar to what MongoDB was doing. And, um, and Mongo comes back and sort of says, we don't think it's reasonable for a cloud vendor to come and take free versions and monetize it and not give anything back. So, okay, that sounds fair. And then, there, and then it gets more complicated. Um, MongoDB uh, freemium strategy worked really well. They started getting lots of customers. And um, there's this great article from uh, Tech Republic and the CEO, Dev Echeria of of, um, of uh, MongoDB com comes out and basically says it. We open sourced as a freemium strategy to drive adoption. That, you know, is a, ma a marketing effort, and they admit it. And other people commenting on this article sort of say, we really appreciate it. CA hosts are thinking about this. He wins for not uh, bullcrapping everybody. Um, he's plain about what their business model is. And, you know, one part of their business model and why they're upset at Amazon is Mongo controls the source code. Contributors are not welcome to the MongoDB open source project. Um, all the core innovation comes from its own engineering team. And, and in fact, in spite of the previous slide, Amazon has asked to contribute, and they were rebuffed by Mongo. So it gets, you know, it's big business, big money, it gets, it gets complicated. But one of the key things um, that we'll elaborate on a little more is there's this distinction in, in open sourcing things about whether you're open sourcing something that's core to your business or open sourcing something that's complementary to your, to your business. And in the case of MongoDB, you know, it's a big NoSQL documents kind of database. That is their business. So it makes sense why they're, ho they're holding it tightly. And, you know, they had a good strategy with going freemium and, and, and getting that viral growth. But there are all kinds of other examples of large companies open sourcing things that are non-core and that have other characteristics. So Google is sort of infamous for open sourcing tons of things. Uh, Android, Ku Kubernetes, the Go programming language, the Angular framework, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Meta is sim similar, um, new, new uh, sponsor 
for Phosphor-G, which is, which is great. And they have been highlighting how they've taken some open source projects like the Rapid ID Editor and certain components of uh, Mapillary, um, the OpenSFM, and Mapillary JS, um, and are nurturing those, um, those projects and trying to get more quality and more co contributors. But be clear, Meta and Google do not make their core technology open source. No one's open sourcing YouTube streaming. No one's open sourcing their search. But they are open sourcing things that are on the outside that are helpful to them, helpful to, to their customers. Um, they support and contribute to um, open initiatives to, to provide tooling that's, that's, that's useful. And, and contributors participate. I, it was interesting to, to check out. Um, yes, indeed, you know, the public, not just Google, participates um, and contributes in, in Android. And, and some of these efforts, they're big companies, they can afford it, they have lots of code, are encouraging adoption of these frameworks and are building goodwill with, with their end users. And they're creating sort of the best of open source, which is getting lots of people contributing and having this sort of pooled innovation. More gets done if it's not just your own coders. So in summary, let me just talk with this. Does that work? Um, so just to summarize, there's three things. There's the Red Hat model, value-added services to support open source technologies. There's leveraging and incorporating open source ingredients to create your own products that are powered by open source. And, there, and there's open sourcing your own commercial technology and figuring out if freemium works for you or helps your business in other, in other ways. So one of the things, as I was putting this slide deck together, that I think is a really important trend and where big pieces of open source are going is this notion of open frameworks. So what is an open framework? Um, found a good posting on this. An open source framework is a template for software development that is designed by a social network of software developers. These frameworks are free for public use and provide the foundation for building a software application. And of course, part of that social network can be employees of big software development companies. But the benefits are, if you have a nice framework that's open and available and doesn't cost you anything, it accelerates your time to development, it increases productivity because there's not reinventing the wheel, there's, you know, websites do the same thing all, in, in all different contexts, but you don't have to have your own same thing. Wide variety of framework tools and specialties across that, you know, spatial frameworks, uh, user interface frameworks, etc. And it leads ultimately to improve software quality. You're not reinventing the wheel, you're making your own software as best as it can because a lot of the open source frameworks are working under the hood. So um, apologies, I'm not trying to pick sides on any of these frameworks. There are dozens and dozens of frameworks, but there's some good examples here. You know, Angular from Google is a platform for building mobile and desktop web apps. Node.js is a framework for server-based JavaScript and building scalable networks. React from Facebook is a JS library for building user interfaces. And DeckGL, which um, is a really interesting thing that I'm following. I'm going to all the DeckGL uh, framework talks that are available here. I had a great one just earlier today. Uh, was a framework that was open sourced by Google and it's basically a framework specifically designed for exploring, visualizing data sets at scale. Big data being analyzed in 3D on browsers. Really cool. And then there's the highly related thing, GeoJSON, which is not a framework, but it's a standard. Um, it's a simple standard. Um, the people who created it want it to remain a simple standard. And it's, it's widely adopted. So these are all like nice building blocks to, to get you started. So, so why do big companies like Google or uh, Facebook uh, you know, make these investments? Well, they can do it partly because it's not core to their business. They're not giving away their own family jewels. They're um, building tools that they recognize lots of people need. Um, and they're productivity tools that many benefit from. Interestingly, Google, which makes its own framework, is adopting the DECGL framework for some of their 3D visualization stuff. Cardo is leveraging this. So again, it's a nice base that others can build with. Um, and you also start building the community behind these frameworks so these frameworks survive and continue to grow and improve. And it fosters, again, goodwill with, 
various communities because good stuff is available at no cost. And so in my view, um, the future is hybrid where there's more and more open stuff, source stuff that's out there, that's available, that's good, that's supported, sometimes by big companies or just sometimes by, by strong communities. And it sort of hit me, um, literally I was flying o over here on uh, Monday and I, um, I do a lot of work with Google and got this blog, Using GeoJSON and BigQuery for Geospatial Analytics. And it sort of helped me understand that open source is kind of everywhere. This isn't, wasn't an open source blog. Somewhere in this blog they have this, um, they have this flow chart. And it's just done very matter of fact. It's not about open source. But all these red things happen to be open source. QGIS for, for processing to get the data ready, GDAL for doing transformations, GeoJSON as the tran transmittal standard, and Kubernetes, uh, which is the cloud orchestration software. And no one's thinking twice about this. It's just normal that open source sits side by side with all kinds of commercial uh, tools. It's just the new normal. And so um, earlier I said, uh, you know, open source has some differences. And one of the differences is um, giving back and sharing and building community is inherently a, a part of doing commerce. Um, you know, and some would argue that MongoDB wasn't playing nice in, cer in certain situations. Um, that's another story. But all of us should try and adhere to these things. You know, understand and be part of the community. Um, don't be someone who just takes, you know, and. You know, in fairness, everyone's doing their part coming to this conference. Everyone's paying some money to, to support this conference or uh, donating money to support people who couldn't come otherwise to be able to come to this conf con conference. And there are many, many ways of giving, giving back. Uh, you know, it's easy to think, well, I can only give back if I'm a coder. Lots of people contribute code, but contributing documentation is, is something that can be done. Um, contributing your time to the community, helping to organize these, these kinds of events. That's the way I personally uh, support communities is, is by investing my time and my company, you know, convincing my company to send me here to um, support these, these kinds of communities. And then increasingly, and we've heard a, heard a, heard a little bit of this in the, in the keynote this morning, is just providing direct financial support. If you're getting value from it, hit the QGIS button. Give them 100 bucks. It makes, it makes a difference. And um, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, <laughs> I've, I've, the, uh, the great talk earlier about all the volunteers, uh, mappers, the community members, Youth mappers, hit their button, um, support their efforts, super, super, super worthy. So with that, um, it's okay to make money. Um, the, the commerce ecosystem is alive and well. There are many different ways people are pulling it off. And remember, don't forget to not give back. Thank you.